so it's not about pointing the fingers at anybody. I'm guilty of it. We've all been guilty of it. Let's, have a, let's just have a nice, honest conversation. And, and this can even turn into Jerry Springer if we want. Uh, the, person that, the person that I know the most out of this whole group and that I don't have any problem putting on the, uh, on the spot is Jonathan Bell. And so uh, I'm going to, Jonathan, I'm going to let you start off with an opening thing. And you'd, so Jonathan was, was the mission director of Church of the Resurrection for um, 10 plus years something like that, 13 years. And uh, I've watched him in, in this mega church deal with the realities of standing in that space between trying to create sustainable good, working with partners in ways that has integrity and also providing a positive volunteer experience. So I admire him. I admire what he's done. And he's, he's been in the trenches in this area. So I'm going to give you the first shot at this and you just say whatever it is that you want. How's that? <laughs> okay. Well, what is the biggest, what's, the, what's one of the biggest lessons you've learned in that, in that tension that has helped you? Wow, that makes it so much easier. <laughs> um, unfortunately, I think I've learned that people will say just about anything. Um, f- if they're desperate enough for your favor, and and uh, and that that it's it's almost impossible when when you when you bring resources um, to the equation or to the conversation to ever really get to the truth. So I know that one of the things that uh, had come up in some of the work that we had done is that the church has in the past has been, uh, we lead with resources. And that's yeah. what you're talking about there. That yeah. when we, in the current model, yeah. we have led with resources. Therefore, yeah. it creates this false and, sense of relationship. And, and we've heard here and we've talked about the, the fact that, that um, most of what we're talking about trying to do here, and, and even most of the stuff that we've done up to this point, um, can't be done or can't be done well without relationship. Mm-hmm. And, and yet, the way we have initiated those relationships guarantees, almost guarantees, um, dysfunction or, or, or prevents exactly the kind of relationship that, that it would take for us to do better. Um, that uh, um, we, t- uh, Tom, you and I have spent a lot of time thinking through sort of the the, di- the dynamics that it would require for a more effective and, and different approach to mission, and and it always starts with a healthy relationship. It always starts with a relationship based on trust and and honesty and 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 um, uh, reciprocity. But um, and accountability, um, and and but then it then it has to that has to lead to to plans, mutual plans for for something that's that's gonna that's gonna be done together uh, ideally to improve the quality of life, um, and then that all requires leadership, uh, and eventually will require resources, and and for us the key learning was not just that those are the four things required but that the sequence was probably as important as, as any four of those. That the relationship had to come first, um, trust, authenticity, honesty, all of that, and resources had to come last. And yet, we almost always do it the other way around in the church. We start with resources, and then we try to find a relationship, and then we... Uh, Try to concoct a plan, which usually we already had in mind before we before we got there, um, and then we get disappointed when there's not adequate leadership to execute on those plans. I mean, it's just it's a recipe for disaster. But but I think for what we're talking about, the key learning has been, or the the toughest lesson has been, that you really can't get to the relationship this requires if resources are already in in play. So, John, your, uh, your role as a mission pastor in the church, talk about the importance of a positive volunteer experience. So I'm going to kind of go 
on the positive side. Why is that important? Sure. It, it, well, I mean, we all, we, we've talked about this. We have to have the sound bite for our senior pastor. We've got to give that thing on Sunday morning that says, this is what we did, and we have to be able to create that, um, that, that, that momentum, yeah, and, and, and that can be a challenge. You know, 1.0 is a little easier, 2.0, but 3.0, it can be, you know, it, it takes a PowerPoint presentation to explain what we're doing. You don't have a 20-second soundbite. But I, I want to, um, so, yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's tough, but I want to pick up a little bit on where Jonathan was going, this, this communication, the relationship with our partners. I want to talk a little bit about that, and it is tough with resources and our marketplace people will understand I was in sales for years and so I knew where I stood you know I mean I was begging for business I was asking for their their business and I knew where that relationship was and so um, when I'm going to customers and I'm but you know calling on potential uh, you know customers it's it's very clear I'm, I'm the one in the position of saying can I can I have your business? And that's what I'm begging for. And I see that in this, at the same place in the um, in in the ministry world. It's very clear. I've got the million dollar mission budget, and 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 these are the folks that they know that, and so they're they're asking us to partner with them. And one of the things that we've worked on, and we've tried to be intentional, is to help people understand, help our partners understand that saying the tough thing does not mean the money's going to go away. Saying the difficult thing to us means that money won't disappear. And that's the fear. That is the fear. If I speak the truth in love, you're going to take your football and go home, you know, and, and that's what they're, they're, it boils down to. And one of the examples that I, uh, I I've always, it's helped me to understand that is um, I could sense with one of our, we were working with a, a, a boys and girls club and um, we had asked them to do some work. And I mean, if we could partner with them in a, in a sports camp and we invited them to come to the sports camp and I could just sense something was not right. They did, they were not all in about this particular thing. And, and the director of the camp was sort of lukewarm about our involvement in this. And I just could not get my arms around it. And I kept saying, come on, tell me, come on, tell me. what's wrong. I just sense something's wrong. And finally I took him to lunch. I said, look, you can tell me whatever you've got to tell me. The money's not going to go away, all right? And once we got that clear, he said, let me tell you, y'all are doing, you guys are doing an evangelism program, an evangelism presentation that's really culturally insensitive. Really, it offends us and it offends our children, and you got to stop doing it. You really do. I mean, it, and so he presented this, and I said, well, give us some ideas. How can we fix this? And he gave us some suggestions for how to present the gospel in a more culturally sensitive way. And that changed the whole dynamic of that partnership because we didn't take the money and go away. We said, okay, we're going to continue working with you. So I don't know if that, if that sure. kind of thing so. so. Pass it over to Desiree. Desiree, um, I want to ask you a simple question to start off with. So is this... Does this feel like a delicate conversation to get into for you personally? Yes. <laughs> I am yeah. in the volunteer management business. <laughs> yes. And um, one of the things that makes it a little different is that uh, it's one thing to have a conversation with an international partner that's separated. Right. It's quite another to be having these kind of conversations with somebody that lives right across the street or across the town from you because the ramifications there. So uh, having said that, uh, admitting that this is kind of a delicate uh, conversation because you depend on the funding right. of a lot of these ministries uh, wanting you to put large numbers of volunteers to work right. in yeah, entry-level kinds of things. How difficult is that? <laughs> it's very challenging, and we actually do have a lot of conversations um, with churches that are very clear that if the volunteer experience is not adequate for their congregation, that they do pick four to six partners, and they might need to go to another agency. So when they have 60, 80 people and they want a team leader for four projects and these are the four projects we're gonna do and these are the supplies that you need to get for them to have their four projects. If my leaders leave that particular task to go help the families in poverty that we serve, 
then it diminishes their experience because we're no longer leading their experience. And we get feedback when that happens, which affects our funding to help the families that we serve. Yeah. Um, we're going to come back. We're going to come back to you. So uh, these folks kind of experience it in all different ways. Wayne, you you providing a, a positive volunteer experience for your employees as they go to India. I mean, what's your idea and your thoughts around the importance and the necessity and the dynamics of a positive volunteer experience? Um, well, it's an interesting question. When we took our employees over to India. It wasn't a mission trip in the normal sense. We didn't actually go over there to do anything. We just went over there to visit and to see. Although we wanted to do something, but they actually didn't want us to do anything, um, which was probably best. Uh, now, I did say we didn't do anything, but I, I forgot. We did bring a, a, a client once who had expertise in, um, I forget, some sort of therapy, and so we helped out uh, with that. Um, but certainly it was important for our employees to have a good experience. If they hadn't have had a good experience, then they would not have felt good about what we were doing. Um, so it's definitely important. Yeah. So again, we're not saying that the answer is all, well, just, you know, just buck up and live with whatever happens. There's a, there's a tension here in that whole space. Ray, I know that you've done, you've actually uh, created an organization that does some stuff around that, especially for some uh, type A high level kinds of folks. Talk to us a little bit about your thoughts there. It's kind of fun going last because you get to make a list. Um, I think everyone ought to have a personal mission statement. And so for me, my personal mission statement is that I want to mobilize leaders who want to use their influence to impact the world for good. And so I started a company uh, outside of Waterford, before I was even at Waterford, called Giant Experiences. And the idea is that in the business world, everybody wants to be the giant. Everybody wants to be the Goliath. But really who they need to be is they need to be David. Um, the company is G-I-A-N-T. The I in giant is small. And that I is small for a reason because we need to be small. We need to serve those around us. We need to be like David, a man and a woman after God's own heart. So for me, the volunteer experience uh, has been a journey that has included everyone from the faith community to taking professional athletes um, to business leaders to medical professionals um, to see and kind of connect corporations and churches with causes. And so in that uh, circumstance, there are some lessons learned. And these are the things that I would say. Is that Number one is it's about managing expectations. Why are those volunteers wanting to be involved in the first place? Um, what I would tell them, first and foremost, and somebody alluded to this earlier, I think it was you, Jonathan, that you, are, you rely on the partners that you deal with to play the heavy. And so when it comes to managing a volunteer's expectation, what I would tell them first and foremost is, I hate to tell you this, but this is not about you. Uh, and somebody has to, at some point, tell the volunteers that it's not about them. The other thing that I would say is that, you know, what is their role and what is the goal? I love what you said. Uh, we didn't go thinking that we were gonna do anything, but what we are gonna do is we're gonna go be eyewitnesses and we're gonna come back and then eyewitnesses are there to tell stories. And so what you're here to do is to come back with stories to try to get other people to the point you're at so that they can have an awakening so that they can become disciples of the bigger picture. Begin with the end in mind. What is it that you want as the outcome when they come back? Uh, one of the models that we've used at Giant Experiences uh, is SEE. -E. So that when we're in the field, SEE, -E, so if I was talking to Wayne, I'd say, Wayne, come and go with me, come see the world. SEE, -E. and he says, what does that mean? He says, I want you to serve. We're gonna find some way for you to serve. And so that's how I actually got involved with Water 4. I took a bunch of professional athletes and business leaders with Water 4 to help them see what Water 4 was doing. And they got engaged and the athletes got into a competition with one of our drill teams and it was a fun thing and a fun experience, but we actually put some holes in the ground in the process. So they, got, they had an opportunity to serve. Now this isn't about Aunt, Aunt B's mission trip and this isn't about going out and painting walls and things like that. It's actually, how do we go out and make a difference? So that needs to be a component. The other thing is, is that one of the most rich things I think that can happen is the E, 
the first E, and that is exchange. If the people that go don't have an opportunity to, to exchange and get life on life with the people that are in your ministry and your ministry and whatever, then they're going to miss a component in terms of the exchange. And then the bottom line is the last E is just explore uh, go on an expedition, have some stinking fun. If you're going to load up and get and go do something dirty, I don't care if it's load mattresses up. I don't care if you're going to Africa. You need to have some fun along the way. I think Jesus smiled a lot in the boat with the disciples. And so that to me is, is one of the things. I'll wrap it up. It's not about missions tourism. Okay? Uh, it's not about that. It's not being able to put a mark by, I went to Nicaragua last year, this year I'm going to Africa. Yay! It's not about that. Um, there's a short-term missions get a lot of bum has a bum reputation right now. I don't know if, if that's a missions point two zero. I don't know if that's part of missions three zero or if that's part of missions one point zero. But I can tell you this: I wouldn't be sitting here right now if I hadn't taken a short-term mission trip. And it was because of someone who loved me and asked me to go. It wrecked me and it ruined me. And you saw the picture that I showed of the little boy. The key is short-term missions that have a long-term purpose. Last two things: keep it fluid and flexible. And when you're in the field, call it what you want to, but the missionary is king. Whatever they say goes. It's not about you. Listen to them. Let them tell you what's appropriate. The T-shirt example was beautiful. So thank you. I, you know, I didn't realize it would be as, as balanced as, as it is here. So you've got some folks that are dealing with this volunteer or personal experience as very profound uh, in where they're at right now in life. So, hey, just questions. Anybody got a question for anyone here on the panel? I'd love to. It may not even be a question. It might just be a comment. Anyone? Yes, Terry. Hold it. Hold it. I meant to bring Daphne with the microphone. I often speak the truth, so I'm just going to throw this out. One of the things that um, I heard said, because um, my heart breaks for Desiree, is that um, I just call out the leadership of the church. When I hear somebody say, you know, the lead pastor has to have the two-minute sound bite. You are the shepherd, and we are the sheep. And we need to be told. Um, and we need to be, you know, there should be an expectation of maturity in the people that go serve. And I know that engagement um, can bring, you know, people to that place of knowing Christ as well. But I, I think that as a church, as, an, as the organization, we have a responsibility to the people in our church as well as the people that we serve. And um, I would just say to Ray's point, you know, the, we have to, um, to disciple, we have to tell them what's expected. And, um, and I understand that there's that tension that maybe you know, they won't give to our church because we told them the truth. But I guess I just think that's, that's why we're there, to tell them the truth. Anybody want to respond? Good, good, good. Well, I know within the body of Christ, we're all, you know, we're all on a journey. And so what we get um, within our doors are individuals that it might be the very first time they've served. And they come and it's about them. And so the teaching and education component on our side that we're responsible for is the discipling so that they can move from it's about me to it being about the community. So getting beyond themselves is part of the discipleship track. And so part of that tension is we get a lot of the negative feedbacks that maybe an indigenous leader doesn't communicate the way that I would like you know, the leader to communicate yet. We know that if we run with indigenous leaders in the community, that that is exactly how we begin to empower a community. And so what they want is for the CEO, because they're brand new volunteers, to be the one to take them on their journey. But I know that in order for this community to grow and develop, indigenous leaders need to be the ones that are out there. And so as they go along their journey and they mature, they'll come back differently later on, but it's part of the tension doing what we do. We get people from a wide scope of where they're at in their walk with the Lord. And so within a church, when they mobilize, they send brand new to mature. And with that, we um, try to manage that into a great experience for the entire group. And that's really where the tension is. Yep, yep. Well, some of it. Someone? Jason? 
All right, so as I'm going around from church to church, um, kind of pitching myself um, as an organization, I've actually ran into this more and more that a lot of churches or even senior pastors or missions pastors are kind of dismissing the idea of short-term mission trips, like, oh, there's no way I'm going to get my people to go on a trip. And and so I'm just I just want to ask you guys if if you've heard of innovative ways to that churches are using to mobilize teams to even come um, on a trip or go on a trip if you've heard of anything. I can only speak from my own experience, but what I have found is that millennials in particular are kind of tired of the shallow mission trip. They want to know, why am I here and I want to get involved? And so what, what Wayne was mentioning about adopting a village, man, that's key to me, is find a place that you can drill down. Don't be short-term. Be long-term in what you're doing. And then come up with a strategy. Work with those local leaders, like you were saying, and ask, what role can, can our people play? So like for us in the water sector, uh, it's not easy. People call me all the time and saying, hey, I want to go drill a well. I'm like, well, bro, do you got a year and a half of training that you're ready to put with this, you know? And I bet you after about two hours of this, you're going to be wanting to go get an icy. I mean, this isn't easy stuff. But let me tell you what I would love. I would love for your group to learn about sanitation and hygiene because when we're hanging out in the village and we're there for about a week, it's one thing to get water out of the ground. It's another thing to know how to handle and manage water. And you, as a church, you could come alongside us and teach sanitation and hygiene, and now you're living life on life and teaching. So I think it's about the agencies, for lack of a better term, finding a way to give a positive experience. Uh, and they may be you know, thinking it's all about them, but eventually something in their heart begins to melt, and you got to meet them where they're at and eventually realize it's not about them. But in the end, it really kind of is about them, and not to be going against my own point, but, but because what happens is they have a transformation that then becomes exponential. And so f- far as I'm concerned, it's about kind of approaching it from a business perspective. I'm sorry, that's the angle I come from, is what is the outcome? What do I want? And what is realistic? What can, a, what can a, an employee do? I ran a 200-employee a um, company, a $40 million company, and we did a lot of what Wayne's doing. And when we would go, we would go and build playgrounds at orphanages. It was a manufacturing facility. And so these these were rough and burly guys. Well, they, they didn't want to go out and probably do Sunday school classes, but their wives wanted to do VBSs and things like that while the guys went out and build, build playgrounds. And so I think it's about finding what is the niche to where they can uh, get involved. Someone else. I think we've got time for one more question. Someone? Mike? Particularly for John and Jonathan, I was one of the things I've been thinking about uh, a, a slightly different angle on this. You are pastors. You're in, in the church. And so you're in a delicate situation where you're supposed to be ministering to the whole community. And so you're, you're not wanting to tick off people unnecessarily. And yet you're also wanting to see this transformation occur that moves to Mission 3.0, which is always a delicate dance of, of, of how you do that. I'm wondering in terms of, uh, and I'm, I'm thinking personally from my own biography here in part of this well, and in fact, I'm getting out of some responsibilities and places I have in the church because I feel like being in those to say publicly some of the things I want to say will damage some of the stuff that people I'm trying to do, I'm involved with right now. And it's better for me not to be involved with them so I don't harm them when I say some of the stuff that I want to say. But I'm wondering in terms of, have you had people in your congregations that sort of get this, that, that, that understand what this Mission 3.0 is, and have been able to advocate outside of the structure so that you're not, it, it's, it's, um, it, 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 and sort of being able to empower them to help them a little bit to be able to say that to work for transformation within your congregations on these kind of issues. You can I get with the question what I'm getting at? Or, is, yeah. So let me see if I understand. You see, you're saying, are, are we seeing people who the light kind of goes on about missions 3.0 and how are we empowering them? And, and are they able to bring transformation in your congregation? Where, where you're not the center person bringing it, but those, those people, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess that that's sort of the case for anything we do, because, I mean, it, and again, I've spent more time in uh, being 
um, in the congregation side rather than being in ministry. And I know that when I stand up and say, hey, this is the greatest thing in the world as a pastor, you all need to do this and join us on this. They're like, yeah, yeah, that's your job. You're supposed to tell us to do that. But when a business leader, a marketplace person says, I went and experienced this and it's powerful and it's amazing and come with me. And that's my, I would encourage you to try to find folks that would say, come with me to Peru to where you are. There's definitely a level of credibility that is um, it's higher than, than us saying it. So absolutely having, and there's been a couple of people in my congregation that have really gotten this and have taken teams to work with Life in Abundance and some of the others. And there was, and this is what I haven't figured out yet, there was sort of the initial zeal. This is really great. This is really cool. Come and see. And then now we're sort of in this place of, in, in those same zealous folks, now they're like, well, it's been three years. Um, and we still can't figure out what our part is in this. We've come and see, we, we've gone to see, we've, we've experienced, we've witnessed, we've brought other folks alongside now what do we do? And it's kind of like your um, India, the, the India thing, you know, what do we do after four years? Because we are used to, I, I'm in a 270-year-old congregation, we're used to being in ministry for decades. Yeah. So when we say this thing's over after four or five years, these folks are going, you know, what, yeah, where do we go? I mean, and so that's a challenge that I still haven't, and, and, and honestly, those folks, because I mean, they're going to be in this church for a long time, they go back to some 2.0 things. They're like, well, that was great. I showed everybody all this 3.0 stuff. Now I'm going back to 2.0. I, I was just going to add to that if I could, and I think this is more to the rest of us who are sitting out here, is that my experience has been is that there are more pastors like you, the two of you out there, than we often realize. And many of them have a hunger for doing some of this stuff, but they're, and they have people in their congregations who are also frustrated and dissatisfied and they think their pastor doesn't get it because their pastor isn't out the up front articulating this because if they do, they're gonna get in trouble. Uh, and so I, I think one of the things I would encourage us to do is to not just assume that our pastor doesn't get it and our pastor isn't interested, but to have some conversations to begin to ask those questions and, and begin to move because I think there's, um, I think we just often misread the situation, yeah. Yeah, I mean, Mike, I think it's, we talked earlier about the, you know, the, the needs of a senior pastor as, as a lead communicator, and, and sometimes that, you know, that, that happens with certain, that comes with certain constraints. I mean, they, they've got to be able to convey vision and, and, and purpose in, in sound bites in, in many instances, and, and to some degree, um, we have the opportunity to, to influence what, what they have to work with, um, and uh, so I think, you know, that's one thing I would say. I'm, I'm, I'm not a pastor. I'm seminary trained, but not ordained. So, so I'm not only leading from in that situation from the second or third chair, but as a lay member of the staff. And, and so if there aren't other people already sort of willing to, to move with you, then, then you're probably, it's, it's not going to go anywhere anyway. Um, and so, so it, I always found that, that people were far more receptive to to change when it became an answer to a question they were already asking, and and so part of what what I've always watched for is, um, and again, you know, the aim was never to to diminish or to denigrate or to demolish the relief and betterment work we were doing, um, but it was to in some respects to do it as well as we could and still help people experience the limitations of it. Because it's in that, it's in the tension around those limitations that they start to scratch their head and say, wait a minute, you know, we made a difference, but did we really make a difference that would last? And once somebody asks that question, then, then 3.0 starts to become an answer. Um, and then, then, yeah, then they're willing to, to begin to ask those questions elsewhere and to, and to, to lead with you uh, around that. Um, but, but yeah, when you're, when you're leading missions in a local church, you're living in the tension between all four of those domains Tom talked about this morning, and, and, um, and chances are uh, your, your pastor is too, your senior pastor, um, to some degree. But, um, yeah. So pass, pass it, final thought. Desiree, have a final thought? I'm gonna, again, I'm gonna pass it this way. If you have a final thought, say it. If not, that, oh, no final thought, okay. 
<laughs> yes, you do. Final thought? Well, I feel like my... I've only expressed my negative side of volunteer, <laughs> having a positive volunteer experience. So thank you, I'll, I'll elaborate a little bit. We absolutely love our volunteers and it's been fantastic to be a part of watching individuals just get out of the church walls and God get a hold of them. That's a fantastic journey. There's just a whole nother component to that as we get the privilege to work with volunteers. And that tension is, is really um, a delicate dance. And I think, I think one of the things that we're saying here is that if you know that, if we can just say this out publicly, that then, then just a conversation with someone like Desiree, how's it going, Desiree? No, really, how's it going? Do you have the support that you need? I mean, if you're in charge of volunteers, uh, do you ever open that opportunity to say, how, really, how were our volunteers? Did we, did we, could we do this better? And just giving permission to kind of speak into that space would make a whole lot of difference from the not for, they don't dislike volunteers. They just dislike being in a place where they can't talk about the difficulties and, and improve on it. So Wayne, final thought, anything? No. And then pass it on. <laughs> any thought, any final thought? I said no to Wayne, then I made a liar out of myself. Um, I, I guess something that resonates in my heart a lot lately, and I shared this last night and I alluded to it earlier today is you know, Matthew 25 is where that volunteer experience happens. And so we don't want to get in the way of what God wants to do in people's lives. And so it's, for me, I take great joy uh, in remembering when it was new and fresh to, to me and what it meant to me when I didn't know diddly poo uh, about it. And then it's, there's something special, all the ugly and all the, st the stuff that you guys go through and all the politics and all that carry on and there's people that want to be led um, because that to me is where the rubber hits the road in the kingdom you know you can take a journey through Matthew 28 and you can know the king but if you've truly met him at the well and he's made a difference in your life and you've become a, a true disciple of Jesus then the things that he loves and the people he loves and the things that he cares for are going to be a part of your heart and it may just show up in a volunteer experience uh, as a part of Matthew 25 very good would you join me in thanking these folks in that discussion? Thank you.